Okay? Well, when I was in sixth grade, it was the last year that we still had recess. And, um, yeah, recess was fun. And there was a, we had this open field at our school where people would play a football game. The guys would go out and play football, and they did the schoolyard pick. You remember schoolyard pick? Where, where you would get captains, and one captain of each team would say, I'll take him. I'll take, I want you. I'll take him, right? The schoolyard pick. Until, remember, it would get down to just a, a few people left. And at that point, they would basically just be like, all right, you guys go on whatever team. Like, you guys don't matter was the message, right? You don't matter, so just, all right, just pick a team. You didn't get picked. Just just get on a team. I was always in that group of people. <laughs> that they're just like, all right, just, just get on whatever team. Okay, um, so so one day, so every every game, I would go out as a receiver, and I would get open, and I would wave, and I'd be like, I'm open, I'm open, throw the ball to me, I'm just standing out there by myself, nobody is covering me, right, but the guy doesn't want to throw it to me, he doesn't think I can catch it, or whatever, right, finally, one day, I'm open, I'm, I'm waving, I'm like, I'm open, throw the ball to me, and the quarterback throws it to me, long bottom, I catch the ball, run for a touchdown, everybody goes nuts, all right? Yeah, the crowd goes wild. The next day, the next day, I still don't get picked any earlier. I still get picked in the, like the last of the last sections, right? I go out, I get open, I'm, nobody's on me, I'm waving, the guy sees me again, launches a long bomb, I catch the ball, run for a touchdown, everyone goes nuts. The next day, I actually got picked a lot earlier in the pick. I was like, cool, hey, I'm somebody now. They're picking me earlier, they know who I am now, right? Well, from there on out, people just covered me and I never got open again, and that was the end of my glory days. Um, but, um, but it was fun while it lasted. You know, uh, in crowd versus outcast. In every culture, there's this group who's popular that we all know they're popular and we refer to them as the in crowd, right? And then there's the people who are not popular. They're on the outskirts and we call them the outcasts, right? They're on the outside. They're not one of the popular people. And every culture has a way of showing who's in the in crowd and who's not. One of the ways in America, as I just demonstrated, is the schoolyard pick. The schoolyard pick shows who's in and who's popular and who gets picked and who's not popular and not athletic. And in that situation, I was one of the outcasts. Have you known what it feels like to be an outsider? Maybe you are pretty popular most of the time, but I'm, I'm betting that at some point in your life, you came into a group and you were the outsider, right? Have you felt that? You're the new guy. You're the outsider. You don't belong yet. Have you felt that? Yeah. Does God care about the outcasts of society? Absolutely. Does he care? Does Jesus care if we go through life unfulfilled? And how would we find satisfaction? Can people with bad pasts have a second chance with God, no matter how many mistakes they've made? Does God offer the chance of salvation to all races and genders equally, or does he show favoritism? Today, we're going to read about an interaction that Jesus had with a woman, and that conversation is going to reveal who God is and what he's like. Remember the concept. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus, who reveals what God is like. And today, when we read this story and we see his actions, I love who God, who Jesus reveals God is through his actions and through his life. The fact that Jesus even spoke to this woman speaks volumes, speaks volumes about who he is and his character. We're going to be in John chapter 4 today, John chapter 4, and in order to appreciate what Jesus did, we need to understand a little about first century Jewish culture. First century Jewish culture. So we're going we're gonna to go back in time and we're going to appreciate what life was like as a first century Jew. Okay? Um, and, and in this culture, there were lots of categories of outcasts. 
okay? If you were in one of these categories, you were an outcast, you were on the outside, you were not popular. In fact, you were shunned, okay? So one of those characters is tax collectors. All right, tax collectors got commissions on every tax that they collected. They got commissions that they got to stick in their own pocket. And if you were a Jewish tax collector who worked for the Roman government, you were viewed as a traitor. Okay, you have to understand, the Jewish people, they were in Jerusalem, in Israel, but the land was controlled by the Roman government at that time. And they didn't like that. They didn't like being occupied by the Romans. So if you were a Jewish tax collector and working for the Roman government, you were viewed as a traitor. Like, how could you? How could you go work for them? Like, they're the enemy, right? In the first century, the word publican or tax collector became synonymous with murderer, robber, and corrupt. That, like, they were everything evil that you can imagine, right? Tax collectors were everything evil. Jewish courts considered a tax collector's evidence as invalid. And the tax collector's money would not be accepted as alms for the poor or used in exchange because their money had been gotten by such despicable means. This is the tax collectors. They're an outcast in Jewish society. Then we have sinners. Okay, this is just a broad term that they would throw out there, sinners. And of course, you stayed away from people who were obvious sinners like prostitutes. Then you have non-Jews, also known as Gentiles. If you were not a Jewish person, the Jewish person, people refer to you as a Gentile. Okay, non-Jews and mixed races. Okay, the Jews had a very elitist view when it came to their race. They were God's chosen people. God picked us, our people, the Jews, the Israelites. And they very much viewed themselves as on a higher level than other races. And they didn't associate with non-Jews. If, if you were a Gentile, they weren't allowed to go in your house. They didn't have you in their house. Your kids did not play together, right? Um, you, you did not associate with non-Jewish people. Um, you were taught this as a child. Uh, God had told the Jews not to intermarry with the nations around them. Uh, and the reason was because he said, if you marry these people, these surrounding nations, you're going to follow after their false gods and their idols. They didn't listen. They did it anyway. And lo and behold, they started chasing after false gods and idols, just like he said. But that mixed race of Jews and non-Jews became known as Samaritans. Samaritans. And Samaritans were viewed as half-breeds. And they were looked down upon, and, and you didn't associate with the Samaritans just like you didn't associate with Gentiles. They were shunned by the Jewish people. This is the, this is the culture Jesus grew up in. Women, get this, for women, at, at the, every synagogue service, men would pray, Blessed are you, O Lord, who has not made me a woman. What a prayer. I mean, that's insane, right, that they would actually pray that. I mean, yeah. Come on, people. This is not right. Yeah. <laughs> Women had to sit in a separate section at the synagogue service. They didn't get to be in, in the inner courts with the men. In social life, few, men, few women would talk to men outside of their families, and women did not touch any man that was not their husband. Not a handshake, not a hug, nothing otherwise. Okay? This is the culture Jesus steps into. We need to understand this so that we can appreciate then the story that we're about to read. It's actually really, really amazing what Jesus does in light of everything I just said, right? By the way, that information was taken from The Jesus I Never Knew by Philip Yancey, which is a tremendous book if you ever get a chance to read it. All right, so this is the attitude of the society Jesus came into. Jesus was a Jewish person. He was a Jewish rabbi. He grew up in this mindset. All right, now... It's one thing to use standards like this of who's popular and who's not. It's a whole other thing when you use these kinds of standards to tell people who God approves of and who God loves and who he doesn't. That's when the problem comes in. I mean, it's a problem anyway, but it's a serious problem when you start saying, well, God doesn't love you because you're X, Y, Z. That's a problem. And, and God is going to correct that uh, through Jesus right now. Okay? The Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, definitely had a holier-than-thou mentality. They thought they were better than everybody. 
They did. Because I live such a holy life and, and you don't, so I'm better than you. Um, and even though they were supposed to be shepherding their people, the Jewish people and their flock, they were actually leaving lots of people on the outside because they weren't good enough to be part of God's people, right? In their mind. Enter the good shepherd. This shepherd was going to radically change the way shepherding is done. Whereas the Pharisees would make it very hard to become part of their group and would leave people on the outside, Jesus would open up a way to those who had been left on the outside. He would search for the lost and bring back the strays. He would bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. He would show the world that God loves everyone and wants them to be part of God's family. Amen. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Remember what I said about Samaritans? Jews don't associate with Samaritans. They don't go to Samaria. But Jesus, it says he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? See, even she knows this is against your rules. You're not supposed to be talking to me. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Amen. That's powerful words right there. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And then she says, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Like, how would you know? How did he just know that I've, had, I've been married five times before? Only a prophet would know that kind of thing, right? And by the way, that thing that he knew about her that, that only a prophet could know is the thing that gets her to believe in him as Messiah later on in the story. So I want to I point out a couple of things about this story. All right, we read two weeks ago where John wrote, he said, Jesus did many other things. I could have told you lots of other stories of the things Jesus did and said and, and miracles that he performed, but I picked these stories that, so that you may believe and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Remember that? He, he specially selected these stories for a reason. So the question is, why did John pick this story? Why did he pick this story to tell us about Jesus? In Jewish culture, this woman already has several strikes against her. All right, first of all, she's a woman. Remember what we said about women. He wasn't supposed to talk to the woman, right? Next, she's a Samaritan woman. That's two strikes against. He's not supposed to be talking to a Samaritan. Then on top of that, she's been married five times, and the man she's now living with, she's not married to. These, this, person, this is a person that definitely would not make the Pharisees cut of being in their group. No, 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 no. 
<laughs> she's a Samaritan, she's a woman, and she obviously can't get her life together. Um, she's not going to be part of our circle, they would have said. Okay? Um, I think John wants us to get the point. The good news story is for all who believe. Amen? Amen. John says... That Jesus had to go through Samaria in order to go from Judea to Galilee. But that's actually not true. It is true that it's the most direct path. Go ahead and pull up this map for us. To go from Judea to Galilee, it would have been the most direct path to go through Samaria. But it wasn't the way most people went. Most people would go on the other side of the Jordan River, where it says Perea there. They, they would go up this path right here. They would go on the other side of the river and then cross back over to get to Galilee to avoid going through Samaria. They would purposely avoid these people. They would even go out of their way and go longer distances just to avoid these people, if that tells you anything. But not Jesus. Jesus purposely goes through Samaria. Why? Because he's a God who's going to reach out to the outcasts. Amen. He's a God who's going to reach out to those who have been denied a chance of access to God. He's going to give them an opportunity to the people who have not had opportunity before. Salvation is going to be for all races and genders under Jesus' new kingdom. Amen. When you look at Jesus, you see someone who reaches out to those who have been left outside the circle. When Jesus told the parable of the shepherd who left the 99 to go find the one, Jesus wasn't just telling a cute little story. He was telling the story of his life. Jesus had left the safety of heaven to come down to earth to search for the lost. Amen. He was the good shepherd who left the safety of the pen to go after the strays. He went after the abandoned, the neglected, the lonely. He saw people that had gotten lost in the pit of sin, and he reached out his hand and said, would you like a way out? He went to the people who were headed towards the dangers of hell, and he stepped in to save them from having to go there. He took the bullet for us by dying on the cross. There's some really uh, good things that I think we can pull out of this story, some really important points that speak to us today and how we can apply this story in our lives in the 21st century. The first application is, number one, we need to reach out to outcasts. Okay, if Jesus reached out to outcasts and we claim to be his followers, then we should reach out to outcasts. True? Okay, and we're going to talk more about that next week. Of Jesus loved the outcasts, so should we. That's next week. Uh, but we need to be willing to befriend the outcasts. Number two, if you're taking notes. Number two, this story has huge implications about racism and sexism. Jesus is teaching through his actions that God's kingdom is open to all races and all genders. Amen. Galatians 3, 26-28 is a revolutionary statement. This would have been a revolutionary statement for this time. I just told you this, the culture, that first century Jewish mindset, right? For Paul to make this statement in Galatians 3 is revolutionary. He said, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Then he says this, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. You are all one in Christ Jesus. This was revolutionary. He was saying you all equally have access to God Amen. under Jesus' new kingdom. Equally, we have equal opportunity and access to God. You know, it's been said that Sunday morning is one of the most segregated hours of the week in America. Guys, this should not be. Amen. This should not be. Why is Sunday morning the most segregated hour? Guys, this is not the dream that Jesus came to make true. He came to bring people together of different ethnicities, of different genders. Um, we went to ch a church in Memphis called Engage Church 
And it was a beautiful thing. It was a beautiful thing. Guys, this church in Memphis had 40% black, 40% white, 20% Hispanic. That's amazing. That is amazing that that even existed, that that was a reality. And guys, that is our dream for Impact Church. We would love to be a multi-ethnic church. Amen. Guys, we need to be practicing for heaven. Yes. Have you read the vision that the Apostle John got in the book of Revelation, where he looked out and he, what did he say he saw? He saw people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Amen. It was a kaleidoscope, y'all. It was a kaleidoscope. He was seeing many different shades out there. And guys, if that's what heaven's going to look like, we need to be practicing now. Amen. We, need to, we need to reflect what heaven's going to look like in the here and now. Let's practice now. Um, a guy named Alex Absalom said something that's really profound. He said, our churches will only be as diverse as our dinner tables. Let that soak in for a minute. Let that soak in. Our churches will only be as diverse as our dinner tables are. Some of us need to diversify our dinner tables, including me. I need to have a more diverse dinner table. I'm speaking to myself. We need to check our hearts. We need to check our hearts right now. And, and by the way, it is possible to change your heart. I knew a guy, I won't mention his name, because he, he, he specifically told me he didn't want this testimony uh, told while he was still living. He's passed on. But I really wanted him to share his testimony because I think it's a fantastic story. This man uh, grew up a racist. He grew up in a racist home. And, and he, he, he grew up for the longest time believing, uh, uh, you know, that, that his race was better than other races. But God did a work in his heart. God changed his heart and transformed his heart. And he, is, he was no longer a racist in the later years of his life. And I so wanted him to get up and give a testimony about that. Because it was, a, it was showing that people can change. That God can change people's hearts. And if we have any impure motives or, or thoughts or attitudes towards uh, another ethnicity, other ethnicities, we need to repent this morning. We need to repent of that right now and say, God, please help me not to be that way. Because we've read several scriptures that say this is not God's will for his kingdom. We need to check our hearts. This man didn't want his testimony. He didn't want to get up because he didn't want people thinking less of him that he was once a racist. And I said, but you're not anymore. That's the, that's the powerful thing, but you're not anymore. Uh, but he didn't want to, and I, I, I wasn't gonna make him. Um, but it's a, it's a point that people's hearts can be changed. Guys, we need, to, we need to watch what we say. We need to watch what we post on Facebook. We need to be really, really careful with our words and with our posts. And, and, you know, guys, I, I have a goal. My only goal in life is this, to lead people to Jesus. That's it. And I don't want to do anything that gets in the way of leading people on his path. I don't want to say or do anything that gets in the way. And guys, we can post things without, without thinking about how it's going to be received by those on the other side. We really don't understand and we really need to keep our mouths shut or not post certain things because we, we don't understand how it's being received by the other people. Just, just, just we, we've got to be so careful, guys. We've got to be so, so careful. Don't say something that would put a stumbling block in front of someone coming to Christ. If this turns them away from me, then it turns them away from Christ. So let's be careful. I've got some next steps. On the back of your connect card it says the first one is diversify your dinner table <laughs> we talked about that we need some diversity we need some multi-ethnic going on at our dinner tables Amen. which will then pour into our churches and then the next next step is go through the last two weeks of your Facebook posts and ask did I post things that made people want to know more about Jesus or did I post things that pushed people away from me and Jesus? Go to your wall. Just read through the last two weeks. Did I post things that drew people to Jesus or pushed people away from me and Jesus? 
And then I think there's a really, really powerful point here in this story about people searching for fulfillment in all the wrong things. So this is the discussion about the water from the well. Jesus said, anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But the one who drinks from the well that I have to offer will never thirst again. What was he saying? He was saying, you can taste the things of the world and think they're going to bring satisfaction, but they're not. They're going to wear off. The excitement's going to wear off and you're going to be thirsty again. But Jesus has water that you will never thirst again. Amen? Amen. Have you ever um, gotten really excited about something that you thought was going to be awesome only to be let down? Yeah. Like maybe it was a movie or maybe you were going on a blind date and somebody said, oh, they're going to be a really perfect match for you. And, and you got all hyped up and excited only to be let down. <laughs> um, so when I moved to the South, apparently they do this thing in the South that I had never heard of in the North, which was put sour cream in chili. I had never heard of that before. So I met Andrea's family, and they have their world famous chili. They claim it's great chili. You're gonna love it. All the people we've ever fed this to love it. And and they yeah. And so they have this sour cream out on the table. And I go, what's that out for? And they go, oh, have you never tried? Have you never put sour cream in your chili before? And I was like, no, because that's crazy. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I said, no, I've never tried that before. Oh, you need to try it. Okay, well, next to this uh, sour cream was this little blue fiesta bowl, fiesta ware bowl that had white stuff in it that I thought was sour cream with a spoon. I thought somebody had just put some of that off into a bowl, right? I put some into my chili. I stir it up. I take a bite and I go, ugh, this is disgusting. I was like, you guys like this stuff? And they're like, well, you couldn't have, what? Wait, what, what did you put in your chili? I said, this sour cream right here. And, so, and, and Andrea's dad took a little taste and he goes, this is mayonnaise. <laughs> and they were like, and nobody to this day knows how that mayonnaise got put on the table. <laughs> but I can tell you, mayonnaise and chili is not good. It's nasty. I, I did end up trying the sour cream in the chili and I do like it. And in fact, I prefer it now. So it is good. I do like it. I'm willing to try anything once for the most part, you know. Um, but, but listen, if, if you think you're going to find happiness through the things of the world, get ready to be let down. Just prepare yourself mentally. You're going to be let down. If you think happiness comes through uh, acceptance and popularity, Oh, if I can just get popular with enough people and get in the in crowd, then I'll be happy. Get ready to be let down yep. because people will let you down. Yep. People will let you down. If you think happiness comes through just having lots of money and lots of stuff and just buying all kinds of toys, you can be rich and be miserable. You can be rich and absolutely miserable. Dave Ramsey is a testimony to that. He said, I used to have all the things you can imagine. He was a very successful real estate agent. He had, he drove Jaguars. He, his wife had all this fancy jewelry. And he said he woke up every morning with this empty pit in the pit of his soul and his stomach because he knew he was missing something. And that thing was Jesus Christ, oh, amen. a relationship. You can have all the stuff that doesn't bring happiness. You know, there's, there's so many people that think they're going to find happiness through relationships. And, and I, I saw, I used to see through high school, I used to see these girls that would just go from one boyfriend to another. They always had to have a boyfriend. Why? They would break up with one and get right back into another relationship. Why? Because they thought they had to have a boyfriend to be happy. And it never worked. They would go through all these people and never find happiness and wonder why. Because that's not your satisfaction. There's only one thing that satisfies, and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And until you start walking with him, you're going to keep thirsting. Amen. You're going to keep running dry. I want to finish by saying something to those who feel like outcasts. I want to speak to those who feel like outcasts this morning. Listen, maybe the world has sent you a message directly or indirectly that you don't fit in. 
Maybe someone directly told you growing up or even recently that you don't belong. Maybe the world has told you indirectly that you don't measure up by putting perfect pictures of models on magazine covers and only casting the good looking people in movies. They've indirectly told you you don't measure up. Maybe even some Christians have given you the impression that you don't belong in their group. And if that happened to you, I am truly sorry from the bottom of my heart right now. I just apologize that that happened to you, that, that Christians made you feel like you didn't belong. I'm sorry people lied to you and made you feel that way. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, Jesus doesn't want me. This church doesn't want me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've come from. I'm damaged goods. I've had a few failed marriages of my own. I've been a drug addict. I've been an alcohol. I've, I've, I've looked at pornography. I've sold my body for money. Jesus still loves you and wants you to give you a chance. And so do we. Maybe you struggle with feelings of low self-esteem. Maybe you were told as a child that you are worthless. Maybe... Maybe uh, uh, someone told you at some point of your life that you won't ever amount to much. But I can assure you this, you are valuable in God's eyes. Amen. God says you are his masterpiece. He created you and he loves you. Amen. Maybe you struggle with feelings of inadequacy. You feel like you're not a good parent. You're not a good spouse. You're not a good kid. Like you'll never be good enough. Well, you are inadequate on your own, but in Christ, you can do this. When, when God called Moses to lead the people out of slavery of Egypt, Moses said, who am I that I could lead the people? And God said, listen, I will be with you. And that's the secret to our lives. It's not that we can't do it on our own. We need God to go with us. In Christ, you are adequate. Stop leaning on your own understanding and trust in God. He is the one who will get you through. Amen. Maybe you're thinking, but I've let God down. I haven't been faithful to him. I've neglected my relationship with him. I've denied him with my life. Well, Jesus gave Peter a second chance after his denial, and he can give you a second chance. Amen. I don't care who you are, what you've done, where you come from. God loves you. And if you are seeking for God, you are welcome here. Amen. You are welcome here. So how do you come to Jesus for the first time? How do you come back to God? He's inviting you. How do you accept his invitation? You need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, who died on the cross for our sins in our place. He was the perfect sacrifice for our sins on the cross. You need to repent of your sins, which means you turn away from living a sinful life and you turn to living for God. You need to confess with your mouth that you believe that Jesus is Lord. If you've never been baptized, you need to be buried in the waters of baptism. You need to be dunked underwater and brought back up. And, and by the way, if, if you've never done that out of your own choice, I'm a, I, I believe the Bible teaches that when you are baptized, it needs to be people who are old enough to understand the gospel for themselves, and they make that choice for themselves, that I want to be baptized. I believe in Jesus. In the Bible, it was always people who said, I believe in Jesus, that were then baptized. And, and so what that means is if, if, if you were baptized, uh, if you weren't baptized out of your own choice, uh, you need to come talk to me. Let's, let's talk about that. Um, and let's talk about a believer's baptism. Um, if you've already done these things and you've strayed from God, let's say you already did all those things. I put my faith in Jesus. I repented. Uh, I was baptized. But you strayed from God and, and you've walked away from him and you've been gone for a long time. How do you come back? You do just that. You just come back. You, you repent and you turn and you come back and you say, God, I want to get right with you again. And so if you need to do that this morning, we want to give you that opportunity. We want to encourage you to come back to Jesus or come to him for the first time. Um, we want to offer that to you. If you need prayer, um, we would love to pray with you and for you. Um, during our communion time, we can pray for you. Uh, and so if that's you, come find me. Come find, uh, uh, if you're more comfortable with a woman to pray with, there's some women here that will be glad to pray with you. But